Hi folks. So I've got in my hand here a simple piece of copper wire. Now we use copper wire because <clears throat> copper is an excellent conductor of electricity. But something almost magical happens when you take a piece of copper wire and form it into a coil. <clears throat> it attains almost magical properties at that point. And we're going to discuss those properties and what causes them, which is going to necessitate a discussion of electricity's close cousin magnetism. And also, we're going to bring up AC voltage. Now, up to now, we've only discussed DC voltage. And with DC voltage, we have basically one parameter, and that is amplitude, or how much voltage we have. But now that we're going to be discussing AC voltage, we also have to bring in a new dimension, the dimension of frequency. <clears throat> so not only do we now have how much, but we also have how often, or how many cycles within a second. And as the frequency goes up, the magic just gets weirder and weirder <clears throat> when we start getting up into the gigahertz range um all bets are off things get really freaky we're not going to discuss that too much i'm gearing most of these videos to electronics for audio equipment repair or basic repair work radio which we will touch upon is a subject unto itself and frankly it's one that i am myself still learning so anyhow, without any further preamble, let's start talking about inductors. So in order to understand what makes coils such powerful devices, we need to stop and understand what happens when we send a current through a wire. When we just put a DC current through a wire, a magnetic field appears around the conductor. And if we lay the conductor in our right hand, and the current is going in the direction of our thumb, the magnetic field is going around the conductor in this angle. This is a right-hand rule, or at least part of the right-hand rule for inductors. Now, that's just DC. What happens is this, and let me interrupt myself here because what I really need to tell you first is we have an axiom for inductors, and that is this. Inductors oppose changes in current. Now you remember when we were talking about resistors and series circuits and parallel circuits, we had some axioms there. Current is the same in a series circuit. Voltage is the same in a parallel circuit. Inductors oppose changes in current. Now, how do they do that? We're just really talking about a piece of wire that's wrapped into the shape of a coil. Well, that magnetic field we talked about is exactly what happens. And what occurs is this. When that magnetic field is expanding around the conductor, that energy has to come from somewhere. And there's no free lunch in physics. That energy is taken from the circuit. And on the load side of the circuit, it appears as though the current has been limited because we've taken the increasing current out of the circuit. When we turn the power off and stop the flow of current, that field will collapse and cause what they call back or counter EMF, and that will try to keep the current going. Now, this is just DC we talked about. Imagine what happens when we are using AC because now we have a field that is rapidly expanding and collapsing at however many hertz the frequency is. If these inductors you use in power supplies, and they very often are in tube amplifiers, we're talking 60 hertz, so 60 times a second, we have expanding and collapsing fields around the coil. And that causes the action that we're talking about. Okay, so up till now we've been discussing DC voltages and resistance, or as it's also known, DC resistance. But now we're getting into inductors, we need to start talking about AC voltages. And as I mentioned earlier, AC brings in the dimension of frequency. So we have amplitude plus frequency. And one of the things that comes into play with inductors as the frequency goes up, 
the reactance goes up. Now, what is reactance? Reactance is basically like a resistance, except it is dynamic in nature. That is, it changes when any of the parameters dealing with it change. And when I say any of the parameters, there's a formula we're going to look at. Now, don't be afraid. We're in AC voltage now. You're just going to have to lose your innocence. We need to look at this formula, and we're not even going to work it. We're just going to talk about it. But it's a very simple formula because you just take each element in there and multiply it by the one next to it. Very simple. So let's look at the formula for inductive reactants. Okay, so here is our formula for inductive reactants. This is our symbol for reactants. The L, if you recall, was our symbol for inductors to honor Heinrich or Emil Lenz. And I always have to remember that because I have a coworker whose name is Otto Lenz, and it is not Otto Lenz who developed Lenz's law. Anyway, this formula states that inductor reactance equals 2 pi F L, where F is frequency and L is inductance. Now, if any of these parameters change, the reactance changes. So if any of these go up, the reactance goes up. If any of these go down, the reactance goes down. However, the first two are constants. And very often, the vast majority of the time, your inductor is fixed. Now there are variable inductors. We find them in tuner circuits, but for the most part, most of the other inductors we're gonna deal with are fixed. So the only changing parameter would be frequency. And as the frequency goes up, the inductive reactance goes up. Frequency goes down, inductive reactance goes down. Now, reactance affects inductors and capacitors. However, capacitive reactance is the opposite or inverse. And we'll talk about that when we talk about capacitors. But for now, this is what you need to know about inductive reactance. Now, DC resistance plus reactance equals impedance. Now, when we measure the resistance of an 8-ohm speaker is commonly less than 6 ohms. The difference is made up by the reactance. And we know, if we know anything about audio, that that impedance swings up and down quite a bit with frequency. And, and this is why. The inductors in the crossover network, the inductors that are basically the voice coils of the speakers and tweeters all have an effect. And this would be a good time to discuss ideal inductors. Ideal inductors would have no DC resistance. They'd be wound out as superconductors. But we don't live in an ideal world and there will be a certain amount of DC resistance to any inductor. Also, if we just think about what the definition of a capacitor is, and the definition of a capacitor is very simple. It's two conductors separated by an insulator. That insulator can be air, it can be paper, it can be some other kind of dielectric, but that's all a capacitor is. Two conductors separated by an insulator. And a coil of wire will have a certain amount of distributed or parasitic capacitance because those wires laying one next to the other or a type of capacitance. So there would be a small amount. In the frequencies that we deal with, deal with, it should be negligible. But if you start getting up into upper frequency RF stuff, as I said earlier, all bets are off and everything comes into play. You'll even see transistors with bodies that are shaped like a four-pointed cross just to keep the capacitance between the leads down. It's just that critical when you get up that high in frequency. And, um, Staying back down to earth where we deal, this is the factor that we have to think about. As the frequency goes up, the reactance will also go up. So the expanding and collapsing magnetic field around, a conduct, around an inductor uh, can be useful, but it can also be destructive. Um, when we turn a switch off, on an inductive load, it's very possible for the switch contacts to arc, and over time, this can cause pitting or burning of the contacts and eventual destruction of the switch. That's why in a lot of equipment, you'll see that there's a capacitor across the contacts on the switch or something known as a snubber network, which is a resistor in series with a capacitor. And I'll show you an illustration of one here. 
Um, and again, the purpose of this is to prevent the destructive arc that can occur from the collapsing field around an inductor. Uh, if you look at the DC relays in protect circuits in a lot of the stereos I work on, you'll see that they all have what they call flyback diodes, and that's their purpose. They're put in, and they don't conduct until the relay goes to turn off, and that field collapsing can actually destroy the transistor that pulls the relay in. So we put those flyback diodes in there to prevent that from happening. It conducts and it makes sure that that current that's created when the, when the field collapses around the inductor doesn't destroy the transistor. Um, speaking of flyback, this is what caused the high voltage in old CRT-based TVs, the flyback transformer, because that collapsing field can generate a whole bunch of uh, high voltage. And you could step it up using uh, what they call doubler or tripler circuits. Uh, we're not going to get too much into that, but know that this does exist. Um, we're going to discuss transformers because this expanding and collapsing field is what allows transformers to work with. Because if you have a primary coil on a transformer and you send AC voltage through it, that expanding and collapsing field will induce a current in the nearby coil. And if they're wrapped around a core, better yet, that'll improve the coupling, improve the inductance, <clears throat> and give you more efficiency. And this is how transformers work. That expanding and collapsing magnetic field induces a current in the secondary coil. And we'll spend a lot more time talking about that. But I wanted to talk about the, um, the problems and, um, and advantages of what happens because of this rapidly expanding and collapsing magnetic field. Inductors come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. The, the simplest of them are simply wire wrapped into the shape of a coil. Um, here's some that are used on the output stage of a Marantz amplifier. I bought, I bought a couple of chassis for scrap. So these are just simple what they call air core coils. Um, this is the inductor I took out of that Pioneer, uh, I think it was the TX930 power supply had an inductor in it. The inductor had opened up. Um, I don't have a lot of inductors in stock because they're usually pretty hardy devices, very robust. I mean, it would, it would take a lot to open up a coil like this. Uh, the entire amplifier would be melted in slag and this coil would be surviving like, like cockroaches after a nuclear war. Uh, it takes a lot to damage a choke or an inductor. They're usually not a problem. I have a couple I bought for a project here from Mouser. These are 20 micro Henry. And that's something else we need to talk about is the units of measure. The units of measure of inductors are the Henry's. And like the Farad, a Henry is a huge, huge amount. So we often deal in micro Henry's or milli Henry's. These were named after, was it John Henry? I think he was the one with the steam hammer in the fable. Um, I'll have to look that up. But this is to honor him. We use these, um, the symbol L for inductors for Heinrich or Emil Lenz. So you'll see L for inductance on schematics. In fact, this board probably has an L marking this. Yeah, this is L702. You can see it down in there. And you'll often see the, that inductors on schematics are marked in L. Now, I have wound a simple coil of wire right here. I just took a piece of wire around it, wound it up in the shape of a coil. I'm going to put it on my LCR meter and just show you something interesting. Now, coils, let's see if you can all see this here. An air core coil is usually a very low level of inductance. This particular one is a fraction of a micro Henry. But if you put a permeable core in, and I'm just gonna grab a screwdriver bit here. If we put a piece of metal or a permeable core in here, you'll see that will go up radically. 
So we have 0.36 microhenries. If we put this in the center, now we have 1.8 microhenries just from putting a core in here. And in fact, you'll see in radio tuner circuits, we have variable inductors. Let's see if I can show you one. Mm, these are not variable. They're like cops. They're never around when you need one. Um, but basically, they are a air core, usually wrapped around a cardboard tube or a plastic tube with a threaded ferrite core in there. And you just move the core in and out to change the inductance. You can see as we take this core out slowly, the inductance drops. Same thing with those. Also, since magnetism plays such a role in these, the shape of a coil makes a huge difference in its inductance. A flatter coil will have, I believe, four times as much inductance as a coil wound like this. And I haven't wound any to try that out, but um, the, the shape does make a difference because the way the fields will pass through or cut through the windings of the coil. A lot going on with inductors. I never realized until I started studying electronics how much there is to a simple coil of wire. But the power comes from the changing magnetic field. So when we get into AC, as we're getting into it now, you'll see a lot of really interesting things start to happen. All right, so we're gonna talk about transformers. Now, transformers come in an almost endless variety of uh, sizes, shapes, and applications. Anywhere from tiny little ones to the huge oil-cooled ones you'll see at electrical substations. But they all do pretty much the same thing. Um, you will have a primary winding and a secondary winding. Um, transformers are constructed, at least most of the ones that we see, uh, are usually constructed of what they call laminations, which are thin metal plates, and they are all stacked together and the windings are wound onto each side of these. Now the purpose of that is to um, mitigate what they call eddy currents, which are currents that can be um, induced into the metal by the action of the transformer. And these cause what they call eddy currents, which uh, generate heat losses. So having them in laminations helps to break that up or mitigate it. That's why you always see all these plates. And sometimes um, the screws and nuts holding the plates together get a little loose and you'll hear the transformer vibrate. Uh, if it's a power transformer, you may hear it at 50 or 60 hertz, depending on where in the world you are. When we talk about power transformers, uh, let's say the transformer inside of a stereo amplifier or receiver, uh, you will have one or more windings on the primary side and usually one or more on the secondary side. In some cases, you'll see the secondary will have what they call a center tap, which is a wire that's tapped into the middle of the coil, which becomes the common point. And they usually are then taken to create a positive and negative DC supply from the secondary side. Um, Sometimes you'll see multiple windings on the primary side, and these are generally for multi-voltage units that can be used anywhere in the world. Remember, just because we're in the US and we use 120 volts at 60 hertz, doesn't mean the rest of the world does. Many countries use 240 volts, Japan uses 100 volts. So if they have different windings on the primary side, they can be tied together or separated to give just the right voltage. So they are, um, multi-use, if you will. Um, we have output transformers in tube amplifiers, and that will isolate the high voltage from the tube amplifier output to the speaker, and they will transfer quite a bit of current, and that's why you never operate a tube amplifier without a load across the secondary or output, because without a load there, that current has no place to go and it will arc internally and can destroy the transformer. Um, you may have seen Macintosh amplifiers have transformers, even though they're solid state. These are not true transformers. These are like variacs. They are what they call auto transformers. 
Auto transformers are more or less a tapped coil, and they provide no, no isolation between primary and secondary, and that's a very important point to understand. Um, case in point, let's talk about stupid here. I was working on a device for a friend of mine, and he didn't give me the wall work with it. It was a 24 volt AC uh, adapter. I didn't have one. So I said, ah, I'll use my Variac, no problem. So I set it for 24 volts, measured it, everything looked good. Energized unit, picked it up, and got the crap shocked out of myself because it's not isolated. It was a valuable lesson that I learned, I lived to tell the tale. So know that Variacs and also the amplifiers uh, that Macintosh makes are not true transformers there's no isolation and sometimes that's very very important um i have a isolation transformer which i use when i used to uh, service uh, crt based television because they had what were called hot chassis and if you don't use an isolation transformer you go hook your oscilloscope up to it you can get a very very nasty surprise um, i've seen people that burn the clips off the end of theirs and in fact this is great when i was in electronic school they didn't have money for nice these like isolation transformers so the teacher said plug the tv in take your scope probe and just tap it across the chassis and if it arcs or blows the fuse uh, reverse the plug in the uh, wall less than ideal in any event, um, there are also families of current transformers that I had seen in industry, which are basically look like donuts with two wires coming out. And the wires are supposed to go to a meter. And you also don't operate those without them connected to the meter because the meter closes the path or you can damage the um, current transformer. Now, Speaking of isolation, there are all types of isolation transformers. They are usually wound with a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, I have this device here. This is called the Buzz Op by Rolls. I use this um, when I was running PA systems for bands because sometimes you get ground loops and the easiest way to break a ground loop is with something like this. And I took the screws out so I could take the cover off and show you that this is nothing more than two little transformers in a box that I paid 50 bucks for. But it was well constructed, it did its job, so um, I was happy to pay it. So if we can have one to one ratios, we can have transformers that step down voltage or step up voltage. And you may be thinking, wow, we can step up voltage? That's great. But you have to know that there's no free lunch in physics or electricity. And you can step the voltage up, but you're at the expense of current, you will have less current. Uh, conversely, you can drop the voltage and have more current. If you recall, Ohm's law told us that voltage times current equals power or wattage. So we can't create more. We can step it down, step it up, but always at the expense of one, either voltage or current. Um, if you look at a schematic for a transformer, and this is usually for coupling transformers, early solid state amps use these. Uh, now we have um, direct coupled amps, so you don't see these anymore because transformers are expensive devices. But you might see two dots on the schematic, and those dots will tell you whether the output of the transformer is in phase with the input or if it's 180 degrees out of phase. If the dots are on the same side, they're in phase. If one's on the top, one's on the bottom, on the secondary, it usually indicates 180 degree phase shift. So the last thing I want to talk about here is transducers. Now transducers are things like speakers and microphones. Um, a speaker and a microphone are essentially the same device. Now the construction techniques are different to optimize the, the uh, attributes that we want. So a, a speaker, take a woofer for instance, will have a large stiff cone and a microphone will have very, very small sensitive diaphragm. But electrically, they are essentially the same device. And you can even take a, a little uh, like transistor radio speaker and hook it up to the input of an amplifier and tap it or yell into it and hear it come out of the speakers. They are essentially the same device, much as motors and generators are essentially the same device. You can, <coughs> you can spin 
a motor and generate electricity, you can spin a generator and generate electricity. They're, they're very close to the same device. And um, I know in the Tesla, they, when you take your foot off the accelerator, that, that motor basically turns into a generator and returns power back to the batteries. And it slows the car appreciably in, in the process. Um, electric guitar pickups are kind of in the family of generators. You have your magnetic field with a metal string moving in that field and when you move that string it picks it up you can also take something like a tuning fork hold up to the pickup comes out of the amplifier or if you're steve stevens and you're playing guitar on rebel yellow with billy idol you can take a little toy ray gun hold it up to the guitar pickup and it'll come out of the amplifier it makes a really cool sound um there are sensors, a hall effect sensors, which are magnetic, essentially a coil with a magnet passing by. And every time the magnet passes by the coil, you get a pulse. Uh, I had something like this on my 10-speed uh, bike. You know, I just had a little magnet. You connect it to the spoke, and every time it passed the sensor, it would um, tell you how many revolutions you were having. You input the size of the wheel, and it would give you your speed and your, your mileage. Um, there are all kinds of inductive pickups. There are coils buried in the pavement, and when you pull your car over it, we saw how metal changes the inductive of a uh, the inductance of a coil. You pull your car over one of these big coils, and maybe a gate opens up or uh, an arm lifts. That's how they work. They're just big coils, just big inductors. So. I'm going to stop this video here simply because it's running long. I don't like to have long videos, especially when there's a lot of information to be grasped. And uh, even though I feel I've given this very short shrift and there is so much more to be said on this subject, I strongly encourage everybody to read or watch other videos. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Carlson has any on this subject, but he's an excellent, excellent YouTube uh, YouTube. Um, creator. Um, I watch a lot of videos by X-Ray Tony B because I do a lot of vintage audio work and he does too and I, I think he's um, an excellent creator as well. There are many, many, many out there. Um, there are many excellent books on the subject and if you can find, I believe, I will try to post a link when I, when I edit this video. But there's a repository of very old books at Howard W. Sam's had some excellent books written in probably in the 40s and 50s when electronics was still fairly new and everything was explained you were not assumed to have known anything and those guys could really write in those days so anyhow please i encourage i strongly encourage everyone to do some more reading when i got out of electronics school I literally just knew enough to be dangerous, and I have been learning every day ever since. And it's a journey, and I don't think it will ever have an end. But anyhow, this has already gone on too long. I thank everybody for watching, and as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Thanks a lot, folks.